Okay, good afternoon. Time flies, so we're just a month away from the end of the semester. I'm going to present to you the plans for week 12. I will do what I was planning for last week, talk about the final exam. Then I will complete my presentation of Barzini's book, Packing to Paris, based on the PDF with mostly illustrations and a few quotes. And I will continue with a quick commentary of a selection of relevant passages from the readings that were assigned from that book. Week 12 is simple enough. You find, again, the same PDF that was posted last week and a page with a selection of quotes. Just that, mostly to support my lecture and my analysis. This is, again, just because the final exam tips and details were posted last week, so I placed a link there. The film for this week, as previously announced, is another film from 1971, Le Mans, with Steve McQueen. An interesting film, both in terms of style and content. And the assignments are just readings from the last book that will be introduced this semester for the topic of automobile and society. It's part of a juvenile fiction series called The Motor Maids. During that time, there were many juvenile fiction series appealing to uh, a younger population dreaming of owning and operating a car. In this case, we find a group of female high school students from Connecticut who will be driving their car known the Red Comet, the car owned by one of them from Chicago to California. You know that there is the last simple written assignment that is due tomorrow to uh, post at least a couple of links that would be usable for your final project to have some feedback alongside with your reasoning why you chose those links. I have uh, finally reviewed and graded all the homework assignments that were submitted until now, left my comments in the Google Docs file, so go check those grades, those comments. And this is, this is what was posted under week 11 about the final exam. So let's review the basic points and then we can open the discussion. You can ask more questions about the final exam. <coughs> so you will find five questions in the final exam. They're just five because they're essay questions to be responded with a, a short essay. But you will answer only four of those questions, any four, it's up to you. Three or four of those questions will be based on the, on the readings that were assigned during the semester, that were discussed in class. And as I mentioned earlier during the semester, you will actually find a packet with readings associated with the questions. It doesn't mean that when you write your short essay about a given question, you have only to include episodes or quotes from the packet, but that is uh, there to help you. And also because the purpose, the goal from a pedagogical point of view is not for you to memorize those readings and just instead to show that you're able to pick relevant episodes and passages and analyze them. And if you have something that you want to use from the packet, then you should be able to do uh, a, a better work uh, with more specific references, with details. Again, the packet will include a selection of readings from the books that the questions focus on. 
meaning if a question is on Barzini, you will not find all of the pages that were assigned from Barzini, but just some pages that I deemed relevant for the answer. But as I said, you can expand your answer outside of the boundaries of those readings from the packet. One or two questions will be based on the films that were shown in class, both for the readings, but especially for the films, I will provide a short list. The short list for the readings will not be very short, will include most of them. The short list for the films will instead uh, uh, include fewer choices so that if you want before the final exam, if you want to view again those films, which usually can be found streaming online, you can do so. You write a short essay for each question. The recommended length is between 300 and 500 words. You can include quotes from the packet. And of course, if you have long quotes, your minimum recommended length should be higher than 300 words in consideration for, for those uh, factors. Okay. So the tips are included here, but by now you probably uh, have seen uh, similar uh, comments when I, whenever I provided feedback, I, I constantly insist on trying to avoid generic statements, trying to be specific, both in your comments and also in the summaries of episodes for which you think the details would provide an interesting overview of a topic. Being specific means also not talking in general about the reading of the question, but focusing on how specific episodes are presented or what happens to the characters. It means to be able to articulate your ideas. What does it mean articulate? It means that oftentimes the ideas, the themes associated to a character or a situation in a book will not be the same throughout the whole story and the character will change. Take Molly Randolph in The Lightning Conductor. Yes, of course, you might say that uh, she incarnates the uh, new woman, the independent, empowered woman that uh, has scaffolded a new identity and a new public persona uh, using the technology of the automobile, but she's not like that throughout the novel. There is a growth, there is a development, there is an evolution, and therefore, instead of just saying, Molly Randolph represents the empowered woman, you should be able to introduce some nuances in the treatment of the topic. I've included one sample question from the uh, exam that I gave two years ago, just to give you an idea that questions tend to be on the longer side, because the idea is that the question should give you directions suggestions, stimulate your memory. As you find in here, it doesn't mean that you have to handle all of the subtopics, all of the suggestions that you find in here, but it gives you a sense of what is relevant, okay? So you can just articulate one or two of these points. We can read this together before any questions from you and my answers in Alice Williamson, Williamson's The Lightning Conductor, 1902, Molly, the daughter of an American millionaire, is touring Europe with her aunt Mary and falls in love with Jack, a man she believes to be a lowly chauffeur. Discuss the representation of their evolving relationship and how that relationship is influenced by their shared experience of the new technology of the automobile include references to relevant episodes in order to articulate some of the following points. How does Jack's technical competency 
and his ability to handle a car make him naturally superior to his presumed social status. What physical, emotional, and psychological effects does riding on the automobile have on Molly and Jack? How is Molly transitioning from female models and practices of the past to the new models and practices afforded and supported by the introduction of new technologies of mobility? So the question itself gives you a model of the best way to respond to the question because the question itself is very specific. As I said, it doesn't mean that you should respond to every single point in here. You can just take one and develop that with good examples. So that is it. Of course, I added the date for this class. The, the final exam will take place on Tuesday, December 13th at one between 1 15 a.m and 1 45 p.m actually in the syllabus i specified 11 30 to 1 30 when you come uh, in here I'll, I'll be here around 11 15 but if you come here before i do don't get too comfortable because the first thing i'll do when i come here to the room is send everybody out with their staff and then place the exams on the chairs and then I'll let everyone in uh, and, and allow you to sit and wait until uh, it's time to start with the exam. Okay. So any questions? And of course, between now and the end of the month, there will be other chances for you to ask questions, especially at the beginning of the class. Uh, when, I, when I talk about the lesson plans for the day, you can raise your hand and we can talk about the uh, final exam, about the presentation, about the uh, final project, etc. What questions do you have right now? Yes. So I was reading, um, I was reading through like, some of the, sorry, let me collect it. So for each assignment, we had a specific amount of points that were given. So there was about four assignments. One of them was worth four, four, three, and four. Yep. So we needed to have a total of 15, I yep. So we don't need to do the last one if we completed the other four. It's up to you. I would suggest you do because it gives you feedback that is precious for the final project, right? Before you come for the presentation, you want to know that you're on the right track, that you're selecting the right documents. But technically, yes, okay. absolutely. You can ignore that as long as you have 15 points out of the 25 per participation satisfied with the uh, other assignments. Okay. Yes, Jenna. Um, you said that you were gonna post like a, a short list of, for the, like the articles and the movies. Do you yes. know about when that'll be posted? Yes, in a week or two, okay. before Thanksgiving. Yes, of course, the black motor card version will be like a traditional paper. So the template, disregard that entirely and think of a more conventional paper where you're focusing on the importance and the role of the technology in that novel. When is the automobile presented on the page? How is it presented? And how does it relate to the profile of the good character, the evil character in the story? How does it advance the plot of the novel? So how is the technology connected to the twists in the narrative? And what is the general uh, tone of the treatment of the car? Is it seen as something positive for society, as something to be scared of? And, and you can talk, you can try and draw a parallel, for example, between the moralistic profiling of the characters and the moralistic treatment of technology in that novel. This for the project itself. As far as the last, uh, the last assignment, the uh, uh, procedure, would, the process would be similar. You would select at least a couple of relevant quotes and explain why you think those quotes were relevant in the story.
okay? And, and of course, feel free to schedule an appointment to discuss specific issues you're facing or receive feedback on parts of the draft when you start writing. And you can also leave comments in the Google Docs files using the comments features, uh, feature built into Google Docs, asking me to review specific passages or an entire section of the paper that you have written to make sure that you are more or less fine with it. When it comes to the presentation, if you've chosen the alternative project, it's still a show and tell kind of format whereby you can talk briefly about the novel in general, about the main characters if you want to, but then you put passages on the screen and you perform your analysis in front of me talking how, on, on how those specific passages are crucial to the understanding of the themes and the style of the novel. And you do this for a limited uh, uh, series of uh, passages or moments in the novel because the rest is left to the paper. And that's it's just to show that you become an expert in that novel and that you understand uh, the references to technology in it. Okay? What else? Yes, Are there specific instructions for the essay going to be posted somewhere? Because right now it's like a sentence that's like a guide. Yeah, because it's the alternative project. Yeah. So it means if you have a strong background, if you're an English major, if you've done other courses where you've written papers, Choose that, otherwise don't. But if you need support, schedule a meeting. But that's, that's the philosophy. That's why I'm not encouraging people to do that unless they have the necessary skills. Yeah, so you can basically take it however you see fit as long as it answers the question. Oh, you mean here or, or I'm sorry, I, I, I thought you were talking about the final essay, the Black Motor Yeah, the essay. The so final project, not the exam. exam. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So you so, can basically take it however you see fit as long as it answers the question you asked. There is no question for the final project, right? Yeah. Is like the, 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 it's the general topic, and then you can take a slightly different angle, right? You you can define it more particularly uh, because there is a lot. Uh, going on in that novel, so you can focus on just some of the aspects that have to do with the technology. You can take it from the point of view of one of the characters. You can take it focusing specifically on the machine, etc. But the, the basic format would be you have a narrative with a uh, the articulation of a topic supported by quotes that are being analyzed with a degree of depth. And if you're not sure whether you're on the right track, the best thing would be to submit a draft, to leave a draft on the Google Docs file, and then leave a comment. If you use the comment feature, I'll be notified by Google uh, about your question, and I can go in and leave my comment or you can schedule a meeting, I can read uh, with you, review with you uh, what you have, an outline or a partial draft and discuss its quality, give you uh, a sense of where you stand in terms of uh, grade and suggestions on how to improve if necessary. Okay, but basically the idea is if you are good with papers and you're at ease, comfortable with writing papers of this nature, choose that. Otherwise, choose the other project. Johnny. Yeah, um, I have a question regarding the essay for the final exam. Yes. You mentioned that we can include short quotes, but I was wondering how does it work? Do you have to memorize them? Or can... You missed the part where I, where I said that a packet will be included uh -huh. with the questions on the day of the exam, and the packet will will include a selection of pages for each of the reading uh, that has a question in the exam, right? So if the, uh, 
if this is the question included in the exam, you would find a few pages. Not all of the pages are signed from the lightning conductor, but a few significant pages from which you can extract quotes or episodes that you summarize, details that you can point at, okay? And, and then I said, of course, the packet will be limited. It's not 100 pages altogether. And there might be other episodes that you remember and that you can refer to or base your question on. And in that case, of course, there won't be any direct quotes. All right, I understand. Thank you. Okay. If you memorize quotes, all the better. Okay, but it's not the Divine Comedy, so it's not something you're supposed to memorize. Yeah, what else? Okay, so again, keep thinking about this. If you have any more questions Thursday or next week, we can talk more about it. This is where we were left last week talking about the book written by Corriere della Sera journalist Luigi Barzini, who was uh, on board the car that won the race organized by French newspaper Le Matin in 1907 from Beijing, China to Paris, uh, France. Uh, he was there as a paying passenger. The uh, newspaper, the Italian newspaper, paid handsome figure uh, to put him on board this uh, car. Uh, and the idea was that Barzini would stop along the way at uh, telegraph stations and send out his dispatches, his wires, his telegrams. Uh, with reports that would be published by the Corriere della Sera, by the Daily Telegraph, who had also purchased an exclusive to that, and other newspapers also included references uh, to Barzini's report quite often. And I said, this is Ettore Guizzardi, who was the mechanician and chauffeur uh, of the owner of the car, Prince Scipione Borghese. And this is the car uh, right before the beginning of the race on June 10th, 1907, from which you can judge how sturdy the car was, uh, how solidly it, it, it was built. But you can compare this picture to other images of the car and notice right away that this is half the car that uh, Ettore is simply sitting on a box, on a crate, that there are no additional gas tanks on the sides of the car and um, no supplies, uh, of which you see a, a great amount in other pictures. And there was a reason for that, because in the weeks before the race, the owner of the car, Prince Scipione Borghese, uh, on a horse, had explored the area around Beijing, and keep in mind that they were going from Beijing in the direction of Mongolia and then uh, entering Siberia. And he knew that the terrain, especially the mountain passes and some of the rivers were difficult to cross with the car as it was. This car uh, fully loaded uh, was between five, four and 5,000 pounds. Uh, and in, even though it had enough power, it, it seems a ridiculous amount by today's standards. The, the, the engine was, I think, seven and a half liters, but the output was around 50 HP, which is less that than you can find in the cars of anyone in uh, this room. Uh, but that output was expressed at around 1500 RPM. So even at low RPMs, uh, without having to rev the engine very light, the car had power, had torque, had a lot of torque, so can, could climb very well. But the car was huge. The car was wide, was long, and the roads 
for the first few hundred miles were not made for this kind of vehicle. They were made for smaller and lighter carts driven by animals, okay? So what happens was, as you can see in the previous picture, was that the cars left Beijing and they drove through the city, of course, uh, and uh, they were saluted by the crowds, especially the foreigners who were working in Beijing, the members of the various embassies and diplomatic missions. But after the car left the city, entering the rural and more mountainous uh, uh, regions north uh, west of, of Beijing, they uh, relied, they had to rely on porters, on Chinese porters, uh, which were called at the time in English coolies, to pull the car. And this went on for days and days. The prince had secured the services of a group of porters. So these porters walked alongside the car whenever the car could drive, and the car would proceed very slowly. Whenever the car could not advance, they would uh, tie these ropes and then push and pull the car through the most difficult uh, passages. Okay? And, and, and the, the book itself is, is completely honest, transparent about this. They, they don't claim that they drove from Beijing to Paris. In fact, not only you find plenty of pictures where the car is being pulled by the Chinese coolies, but if you read the introduction, which allegedly was written by the prince, Scipione Borghese, but I'm sure that was written by Luigi Barzini himself, and the prince simply said, you write the introduction and I'll sign it, write it very well to honor me, right? And, and Barzini thanked him because that was the, 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 the practice in those kinds of situations. In the very first page of the introduction, right from the first and second paragraph, the prince is saying, if what we did showed one thing is that you cannot drive from Beijing to Paris. Because they know that by itself, the car could not be driven. And he adds, what is the implication? The implication is that you couldn't establish a commercial uh, uh, traffic, uh, a commercial route with vehicles, bringing goods from Europe into China. However, the prince goes on to explain what we did has other consequences and shows that certainly cars are important, they're important for the transportation of supplies, there is an implication that they're important from military operations, etc. But the inclusion of these pictures, the inclusion of very frank details about the use of coolies is part of the overall approach and style used by the journalist Barzini, who thinks that the good journalist, keep in mind this idea of the place of a journalist in society, as one of the intellectual branches of the power, of the leadership in a society, one of the key functions of a journalist is to provide true, accurate information that can be used to then make informed decisions and to pretend that the car drove autonomously all the way during the 10, 9 or 10,000 miles of the race would have been not only inaccurate, false, a misrepresentation, but would have made the book itself less useful to anyone, either an entrepreneur or a politician, trying to make decisions and plans based on what 
the new technologies, commercial vehicles or military vehicles can do in China or in other places. Again, don't forget the implied or hidden military implications. Even later on, Barzini, for example, six years later in 1913 was sent to Trieste, which was under Austria at the time. It is now part of the Italian state. Uh, to write a series of articles about how Italians, the Italians of Trieste, were being treated by the Austrian government. Remember, 1913 is one year before World War I started, although Italy entered World War I one year later in May 1915. But alongside his reports, which were politically uh, uh, infused with, with this desire of, of liberating with the war the Italians of Trieste subject to the uh, oppression of the imperial government of Austria of Vienna. Besides that, uh, uh, Barzini wrote also a series of reports for the journal itself and the journal probably sent them to the government about military troops, the Austrian military troops stationed in Trieste, the military ships, uh, etc. At, at some point through his career, Barzini, though, uh, uh, got uh, a, a reputation that was not a positive reputation, the reputation of someone who was aggrandizing uh, particulars or details of the articles that was um, exaggerating or distorting certain aspects of his stories for the sake of delivering a bigger impression on the readers. And this reputation manifested itself in a couple of anecdotes. One was that in 1917, when the Italians suffered a tremendous defeat by the Austrians in the Italian Northeast on the front line, almost lost the war, the Italian soldiers uh, uh, created a song making fun of Barzini because Barzini was uh, downplaying the, uh, the crisis that the Italian army faced and the suffering of the soldiers. And during the 1930s, even though Barzini seemed to be a good supporter of fascism, Mussolini himself was critical of Barzini and Mussolini coined the label of Barzinismo, Barzinism, for second-rate journalism that is completely unreliable. Okay. But again, we must say that there is at least some truth and honesty, even though overall the tone of this book is somewhat emphatic, right? And there is uh, an emphasis on the positives of Western civilization and the negatives of Eastern civilization, and I'll return to that uh, when, when I comment on some of the passages. But these are uh, our heroes, the prince and Ettore on the car, Barzini is behind the camera, and the Chinese uh, uh, coolies are doing all the work for the car, right? And that's why the car was initially taken apart to make it lighter uh, because it was easier to bring the other parts, the empty tanks, the supplies on carts or on foot. In here, you can appreciate the level of difficulty of some of the mountain passes, right? You can see how treacherous, narrow, uh, and uneven the road is in this particular passage. So. It's not just the technology of that time. Um, even now, you, you would need a real SUV, not the SUV, the, the pseudo SUVs driven by most people now, a real SUV to go through this road. Again, picture after picture, this is the reality of the first few hundred miles. And as I said, even when the car was able to drive itself, it would drive very slowly or wait for the coolies 
to join them, right? Because they had this team working with them. And as I said, when we talked about transportation in general, we said we've forgotten how essential porters in every economy, not just in China, but even in Italy or France or England, how essential porters were, how important the use of human muscles still was until the 1920s or 30s, meaning that a lot of goods and supplies were transported, transferred, just using human strength. The same is true for the carriages encountered by Barzini in the desert. Because although this may give you the impression that Barzini is trying to show that transportation used obsolete vehicles in Asia at that time, Italy had similar carriages during that time. The roads of Italy were populated with carriages uh, in 1907, as you've seen, for example, even from the reports, the passages of a motor car divorce from 1906. So certainly this picture is meant to be symbolic. It's meant to be the allegory of the past versus the future. And this is even more apparent when you have the car and these carriages, right? And you have the old style carriages going in one direction the past, and the car going in another direction, the future, right? And there are other uh, pictures that are meant to be symbolic. I skipped on one the other time, but look at this. This is the Itala car, and now you can see how it looked when it was fully equipped with spare tires, with additional tanks of gasoline and all of the supplies on top of it. The, the planks are the same that were used as mud guards, but here being disassembled because they can be used to place them on the ground if the ground is muddy and move the car on them. At this point, traveling from Siberia into Russia, there are no good roads but they see that they could travel on the track, so they ask permission from the Russian authorities to stop the trains long enough to have the car travel uh, alongside this lake uh, to uh, a point where they can proceed on the road, okay? And as far as permission, keep in mind that the prince was a European aristocrat. That European aristocracy was connected, but the prince had friends in Russia, spoke Russians, so certainly this is also leverage that he had politically and socially to exploit. But this clearly is such a symbolic picture. The car replacing the train. The train as a technology that is about to be replaced by vehicles such as this. And the same symbolic value can be found in the picture where you see the cars pulled by oxen in going in one direction, the car going in another direction uh, in the Gobi Desert uh, somewhere in Mongolia. I mentioned how at some point driving from Asia into Russia, so when they had covered almost the most difficult part of their journey, they crossed this bridge and they had found, and some of the passages reflect that, they had found a number of bridges made of wood which had been built by the engineers of the Russian army for the war between Russia and Japan that took place a few years earlier, but those bridges were not maintained and there were usually, uh, the crew of the Itala was usually very careful navigating those passages. No matter how careful they were when they crossed this bridge, uh, uh, the, the wood broke, the car went down, and you can see here 
there was a brook that was almost empty of water but full of rocks underneath it seemed the end for the Itala and certainly a very dangerous situation for the crew. The prince and Ettore Guizzardi uh, survived with uh, little consequence, but uh, the journalist instead hit his head on a rock and suffered a trauma and was confused for a couple of days, but of course didn't want to abandon the car. And the car was so solid, so sturdy, and they were also lucky, evidently, <clears throat> given, for example, the amount of gasoline stored in this tank that must have hit in the rock beneath, that they were simply able to call on farmers, on peasants, offer them money, uh, and with the help of ropes, they pulled the car out, and the car was able to continue. They, they checked the car, they restarted the car with minimal uh, uh, fixes made by Ettore Guizzardi, and they continued. Even though the race took place in the early summer, June, July, and then early August, the conditions were not favorable, especially the nature of the terrain they found a lot of mud everywhere. And so it's not surprising that one of the honest admissions is in the, found in the book is the number of times that Itala gets stuck, which again, is not about the honesty, it's about the journalist providing exact information in case anyone got the idea from this book that you can send commercial goods on a track from Europe to China and vice versa, well, you have to find a period of the year, a season, or a, a route uh, that would avoid these issues, right? And without that kind of information, then the book has no utility. And the social function of the journalist is completely, has completely missed it, its point. Once again, though, this photo is not just about the car that is stuck, but also about the people, the interest, the curiosity that the people manifest, the people from this village are manifesting for the car. Because one of the themes in the book is how are people around the world reacting to the new technology? How will people around the world be able to live on in the next 10 or 20 years in a world inhabited more and more by commercial vehicles and internal combustion uh, engine vehicles. This is the Itala stuck again in Siberia. This is stuck near Irkutsk and you can see how People are coming from the city, which is not too far, with bicycles, with carriages, to see this car. For some of them, this is the first car they must have seen. This is another of the many pictures about crowds surrounding the automobile. And do they show hostility? Are they anti-motorist? And the theme of anti-motorism was very frequently uh, treated in the literature about the car. There were entire articles, chapters in books written about this thing. So it was important to show that even people who lived in an area where the use of technology was very limited in agriculture and in commerce, they're not hostile. They seem to be favorable to the introduction of automobiles. And this is a famous passage, which is also mentioned in the introduction. So the introduction itself makes this an essential passage. It's one of many uh, instances in several instances in which someone tries the automobile for the first time as a passenger. What is their reaction? And this is about 
the success that the technology will have with anyone in the world, with the average people in any country. And as you'll see, it is about the fact that the car will win, will uh, generate a positive reaction mostly through the psychological, nervous, physical reactions produced by the stimuli of speed. So they are Irkutsk uh, and a local merchant, oftentimes they stop at Russian cities and of course they have dinners with the wealthiest part of the population. They're usually invited by aristocrats, by um, members of the local government, by uh, rich merchants. And one of these merchants asks them to uh, ride with them in the car for the next two or three hours until the next town, and then he'll come back uh, with, with a carriage, with a horse, etc. And that is uh, Radionov. And this is the reaction of that merchant who's never been on a car. Radionov, who was now being initiated, notice the language that is being used, initiated, you have initiation, the language of religion and anthropology in general, initiated for the first time into the inebriating joys of velocity. And you find a reference to drunkenness, which is a state, a condition you cannot control. And that's how the car as a technology is deemed to be successful. Because it's not about reasoning and accepting the utilitarian functions of this technology. Once you try, it overwhelms your senses and immediately you are taken hostage in a biological sense to the technology. Remember the allegory of being seducted and then taken hostage on the technology in Jules Verne's science fiction novels. In here is the, your own biology that pushes for your desire to have a car because you're on a car and the speed has this effect. You're high, you're drunk, you're intoxicated with the pleasure of feeling the speed. Was uttering cries of wonder and enthusiasm. Cries, it's not a commentary, it's not a discourse. It's not a discussion about the car. It's like a baby. It's pre-rational, right? But when you see these uh, anecdotes, then you know that the technology has already won. At every longer flight of the car, he fervently reaffirmed his intention to get a motor himself. So during the ride itself, not even waiting until the end of the first ride, he says, I want a car. Right? And of course, think of all the indications that the digital technologies of today are winning over. You, don't need, you need marketing to affirm and support the success of one brand against the other, but the cell phone has already won, right? Because you see people not being able to go for two hours or a weekend without their phone. You see people... Uh, sleeping with their phone in their bed, etc. He should have won at once. And this is typical of modern marketing, of the modern consumption culture. Not only that you want something, but you want it right away. And again, think of cell phones and other products for which, as soon as they're out, or with pre-sales before they're out, people uh, try uh, to, to get one, right? And, and, and there are people who are not even able to get into the pre-sale because there are so many uh, uh, customers who want a product right away, a tablet, a phone, a computer, well, not, not a computer at this point. He would order it as soon as he got back home. He would telegraph for one. And there you see how the telegraph plays into this. Telegraph means speed because you send a telegram and the telegram received within, let's say, half an hour, an hour, in Brescia, Italy, where the Itali Itala is being built at the factory, and they start building one for this particular customer. But the idea is, I want one now, 
and the fastest possible way to order one, not being able to go online, is to send a telegram to the factory. He would have one identically like ours, right? I want exactly this one. After a little while, his enthusiasm seemed to abate. Our excellent companion seemed to have become taciturn, silent, right? And he goes on to, to eat. But again, it doesn't matter because you see that a new customer has been created by this experience. What counts is the fact that he had this immediate and powerful reaction to the car that will not be uh, forgotten. Okay? And then it's about, the rest is about eating sandwiches while driving the car. Not only was the car pulled by Chinese coolies during the first part of the race, there were instances in which they had to use ferries to go through a lake or a river. And again, the book is direct, doesn't hide that the car didn't drive for the entire itinerary. And plenty of times you see pictures of the car surrounded by people, which is the journalist's way to provide evidence of the overall positive reaction of the people to this technology. Even though they're not familiar with similar technologies, the reaction is positive, which means that they could become potentially users of this technology, that there is no immediate rejection of the car, that the change, the transition is possible or it's well underway. This is one of the many articles published by Le Matin, the French newspaper that organized the race. And you can see how this is presented as a global event, right? You see, you see this representation of the world with Europe, Africa, and Asia, and the itinerary and where the cars are right now, Irkutsk, uh, right outside China. Well, of course, they're always exaggerating. Irkutsk is farther away from China than it looks in here, right? And the destination, which is Paris. And this is the first page, right? So, because the purpose of this initiative was for them and other newspapers to sell more newspapers, right? Imagine what you may have seen in films uh, set where the story is set during this period where you have young kids going around the streets of a city such as Paris or Rome or London shouting, buy this, this newspaper, read the latest about the race from Beijing to China, from Beijing to Paris, right? And again, it's about the positive reaction, right? Irkutsk is en fait, is celebrating the arrival of the car, right? So it's about the celebration of the success of the global success of this technology. And you can see here the details. And Barzini is also very careful at defining the ethnic groups or the races encountered along the way to document the various reactions. So it's like a report, a, a comprehensive report of how the people living in every region crossed by the Itala on its path, on its journey to Paris reacted to the automobile and not only in general the races as they were seen during that time, the ethnic groups, but also men versus women, families versus single workers, um, different social classes, the wealthy, the poor, right? It, it's a comprehensive view of the reactions of the world to the new technology as an indication of the degree of success that the technology could have and whether or not in the future you can establish a business based on this technology in any of those areas. Again, you see a Mongolian family, 
the single rider, the Mongolian family, the women of this Russian village, young women, older women, right? Because that is the menu, the smorgasbord of reactions to the technology. And there are passages such as this highlighting the admiration, the appreciation of the technology. Some express the greatest surprise. They seem stunned and let their tools pour from their hands in their astonishment. So the car is seen here as a magical, a supernatural technology. Others run gaily to look at the car as a crowd runs to look at some harmless but strange phenomenon, right? It's a phenomenon. Or a troop of itinerant mountebanks passing by with their caravan. Keep in mind, this was a frequent scene, especially in Europe, where you had these groups, or you might have a single um, uh, performer with a dog and a bear traveling from city to city, making money off of their shows with the animals. A few fled, a few, right? The others are curious, they're attracted. But when we stopped, the reactions earlier were about the cars driving through. When we stopped, everyone was reassured. And about the cars driving through, keep in mind that the car is driving at low speed compared to today through most territories, right? 20, 30 miles per hour per hour, rarely reaching 50 miles. Everyone was reassured and approached us. This is the positive reaction. And a moment later, they would treat both ourselves and our car with the most friendly familiarity, ourselves and our car. The younger generation admiring the machine and putting everything pertinent questions to us concerning its speed and its strength. Of course, the younger generation are those who will live through the technological revolution and transformation that will populate the planet with cars. The Italy was, the Itala was the goal of an innocent and fantastic pilgrimage. Again, the language of religion, the language of magic, because this is the, the, the fetish of the world of the future. Technology becomes uh, the, the sacred element of the technology of, of future societies of the 20th century. All the, all the crowd stood round with respectful admiration, as before, a sacred mystery, again, the language of religion. And this is the cover of the Italian version of the book. And as I said, it's important to remember that it was translated in 11 languages, right? And this is the first edition, the same year we are reading from a 1908 uh, digital reproduction, but the same year, as you can see here, of the race, the translation came out with a concerted effort to make this a, a media event, right? Whereby you've heard about it, you want to read about it right away. And around this time, 1907, other publications talked about the incoming technological revolution. This is one of the most important, even though it's not being translated. I translated a few pages. Uh, Mario Morasso was himself a journalist and intellectual a writer, and he published in 1907 Il Nuovo Aspetto Meccanico del, del Mondo, the new mechanical aspect, the new mechanical look of the world, meaning the world will be reshaped by the technology of the automobile. Around the same time, of course, uh, this is a French magazine, the car was under everyone's eyes in a variety of ways, right? And we ourselves, we've read about the plays and stories based on the passion that is facilitated by the automobile and how the automobile uh, driven by Cupid, is the enabler for uh, a, a romantic relationship or even an erotic relationship. Of course, you see these two lovers who are driving down the cliff. It doesn't matter because they're on the automobile, right? And that's all for them. And 
with just as a reminder of the play we read in my translation in Automobile, this is the author Alfredo Testoni, which was also published around that time, although it had gone on stage, as you see here, in 1904. So 1907 is really a turning point. This is a caricature of Alfredo Testoni holding an automobile because he became famous with that play. And this is a copy of the book he published with sonnets about the automobile. Remember, we also read that. So it's around that time that you have this idea that the automobile is about to become a popular product, is about really to be mass produced and change uh, the cityscape and the landscape of territories inhabited by humans. In 1907, this book was also published at the end of 1907, still with the same title, uh, very direct, very popular in Automobile. Carlo Platti was an art historian, a writer, a journalist. He traveled extensively with Berenson, who was an American uh, discoverer of lost masterpieces. And he wrote this book about touring Italy and Europe on an automobile, about tourism made new by the automobile. And the last chapter is all about the friends and the enemies of the automobile, as I uh, uh, mentioned before. It's necessary to have this in mind because for us it's a given that who would be against the automobile. But during that time, some were seriously worried that the technology would not be accepted. And therefore, the very idea of tech evangelism, of having someone to support the good qualities of a technology came about during this time and is still part of the marketing strategies for digital technologies these days, right? This idea that you have to have someone to push for the technology to establish a base and the acceptance of the technology. Also notice the illustration, right? This is typical. And we've seen this uh, in illustrations or passages, for example, Vern, right? The clouds of dust, the wind surrounding the driver, but this makes the driver almost a supernatural figure. The fact that you don't see because of the mask, the goggles, you don't see the face of the driver and makes the driver itself, himself uh, quite mysterious. By the way, this is a dedication by the author himself to, I don't remember whether it was an American or a Canadian professor. So this is Carlo Placchio himself. And this, these are passages of the book. For example, this chapter is about Abruzzi, which is a region in central Italy, right? But they're showing how, with the help of a chauffeur, the writer is traveling through Italy and again, the wind, they dominate over the landscape, right? Same here, look, since you cannot see the eyes, look at the representation of the face of the chauffeur. And this is the idea of the intoxication, of the inebriation with the automobile. And this is another chapter about going through Provence and France, okay? So this is, uh, a picture when they got to uh, the Mongolian frontier. Mongolia is an important part in the plot, the development of the book, because finally the car not only can drive by itself and they uh, don't need the porters anymore, but they can drive very fast because the terrain is dry and compact enough. And that's where they reach full speed, which could have been 50 or 60 miles uh, per hour, um, right? And you see the configuration of the car without the supplies. The supplies are on the ground, but you can see the two spare gasoline tanks and the additional oil and water tanks. And in the middle, this was supposed to be the seat for the journalist Barzini, but most of the trip supplies were placed in there and he was sitting next to the driver or the mechanician with his 
foot on the sidestep of the car. And of course they have the, the flag, is the Italian flag. The, the flag is different from the one you may see uh, these days simply because there is a symbol of the monarchy in the white stripe of the tricolor flag of Italy. But keep in mind that this is the age of nationalism, colonialism, so they are representatives of the best of Italy, etc., etc. There is this rhetoric. And you find this rhetoric of civilization, of the superior Italian or European civilization, in passages such as this. We feel the pride at that moment, driving through Mongolia, we feel the pride of a civilization and a race, right? They're a superior race. The civilization of Europe overshadows us. It is resumed and symbolized, resumed in here means summarized, symbolized by the speed of our flight. Notice how civilization, modern civilization and superiority are identified with speed itself. Speed is the staple, is the main feature of modern civilization according to the intellectual, intellectuals of the earliest part of the 20th century. The great longings of the Western soul, its strength, the true secret of all its progress, it is resumed in the short word faster, right? Speed in everything from the telegraph to the car is supposed to be associated with superiority, with Western civilization. And China, there is an easy simplistic comparison. China is a country that resists progress, that seems to be still uh, unable to change, unable to embrace this quality of speed that is typical of modern, of the modern world. Our life is pursued by this violent desire, this painful insatiability, this sublime obsession faster. So here you see the emphasis, right? The nationalistic, uh, emphatic style of Barzini, adopted by Barzini for this book. And that was also the conclusion. I'll just continue for a few minutes and circulate the attendance. In the meanwhile, let me show you from the page with the notes and excerpts. Let me show you the map included in the publication of the book. I have a copy of, of the book, uh, the, the first edition, which nowadays is a bit expensive. And you find this map inside with the journey. And notice that there, is, there are numbers, red numbers, along the itinerary. And then the red numbers are explained. Of course, I have the Italian edition explained, meaning this is what happened here. Itala uh, sank into mud at number 16, and you find it, and you know where it happened. So this is indicative of the pragmatic approach, right? It's the factual story of this journey from Beijing to Paris, right? And it's not so much, you see right away that in the story, it's not about the Itala racing against the other cars. It's about the Itala performing this thing, this adventure, right? They, don't, they didn't really care about winning, and right away it was clear that they would win unless the car broke down, or unless they made some mistake along the route. And keep in mind that the prince who was wealthy and who, who had this managerial mindset had arranged all along this itinerary, it's probably these flags that you find in here, right? You see the flags? Had arranged for gasoline, spare tires, other spare parts to be delivered in advance so that whenever they stopped, they would find someone holding these things for them so that they knew they could refuel. They didn't have to scramble to find uh, gasoline or tires in areas where very few or no cars were present. Everything was organized from the beginning and they would find an abundant amount of everything they needed. And of course, they went through a 
large number of tires. Um, they needed small uh, spare parts. They didn't need any major uh, fix and repair. They didn't have any breakup with the exception of a the exception of, of a wheel. I've skipped over a picture. Let me see if I can find it again. And that will be the last thing for today. But let me find. The picture that I have in mind. No, it must have been somewhere else. I wanted to show you a picture of the Russian carpenter who redid one of their wheels because the wheel itself broke and a carpenter was able to simply take a disc and carve with an ax the spokes of the wheel and that wheel uh, uh, was strong enough to carry them up to uh, Paris, although they had to add metal wires to keep it together at some point. But even this episode is then considered by the journalist as evidence that people in rural or marginal areas of the world where technology has not been introduced will be able to adapt because the carpenter who usually does wheels for the carriages will be able to do wheels for the cars and turn into a mechanic because he has skills that can be retooled, reshaped to serve the new technology.